good afternoon everyone and on behalf of indira gandhi national center for the arts i welcome you all uh, and i am really grateful to ari sheftel for accepting the invitation to speak on uh, preventive conservation of alka painting and before uh, she makes a presentation i would like to give a small uh, brief about uh, about this presentation so we have this uh, a webinar on care and conservation of tanka paintings so uh, tankas are buddhist paint paintings generally found in tibet ladakh madhyapradesh uttar pradesh bhutan there are buddhism is popular uh, and it is generally made on cotton and silk they depict uh, tanka they depict normally a buddhist deity a scene from a buddha story or a mandala you can have all three or you can have one of either uh, one of uh, Themes. With the veil, they are prone to deterioration due to organic nature, rolling and are worshipped in a monastery, and hence get exposed to lamps, soot, incense, smoke, and pollutions. Uh, Anne Sheftel is going to speak in detail about all these things. So, uh, Anne Sheftel has over fifty years of experience in the field of tanka conservation worldwide. and chaftel here she is also on the webinar and since 1970 and has uh, worked in conservation of buddhist art for museums monasteries universities and centers of dharma and is a fellow of international institute for conservation fellow of american institute for conservation canadian association of professional conservators and member of icom and icomos i'll uh, hand over the webinar platform to and shaftel and will not come in between the audience and then shaftel and we go directly to the topic thank you very much and welcome and shaftel uh, ignc webinar series thank you so much for coming to this presentation from around the world and it's based on your questions we have tanka owners and caretakers from every country every continent and i'm thrilled to be your servant as an experienced person only 50 years but i know a little bit about tankas and i'm at your service to answer any questions you have i did get an introduction and uh it is true that for 50 years i have worked in in monasteries and i'm quite happy working in monasteries as remote as possible i quite enjoy the life there uh, because i um so um appreciate tankas in their uh, natural life in other words where the tankas are meant to be to serve their purpose now working in monasteries i have been bitten by two rabid dogs attacked by a monkey with a brain virus etc etc but that is the monastery life for me and for the tankas i also work in museums i do love working in museums especially working with staff when we find a tanka collection that has remained rolled down the basement of a museum for many years we get to explore it together and document it again i'm quite happy working in monasteries and for that reason i wrote preservation of buddhist treasures resource for monasteries it's a free online resource about preservation of monastery resources low cost and practical that's my introduction and i'd like to say hello to the viewers here are a few of the viewers and their questions about tankas on which this talk is based Sharon's asking about tankas in home.
These are a few of our viewers and their questions. Thank you so much, participants, for joining us from around the world. I really feel honored. Let's talk about the Tonka form. Tonkas are puzzling. People are asking, what is the function of a Tonka? The function of a Tonka is to communicate Buddhist teachings. There was a long time in the world when people did not read. And in order to learn about uh, Buddhist concepts and to have a guide to their visualization, the Tonkas were used to transmit that information to them. This still goes on. For example, Dodrupshin Rinpoche in Sikkim had a text that had never been illustrated. And he realized that more people would be looking at the Tonkas, the pictures, than reading this long text. So he hired a contemporary Tonka painting master to illustrate it. Here's an example of the teacher himself, Dodrupshin Rinpoche, and his stylized portrait in the Tonka series. Tonkas and text have a very direct relationship. For example, a lot of blessings and texts are found actually on the Tonkas. For example, here on the back is a whole lot of information in text form about this deity. Tonkas themselves are, well, very complicated. As conservators, we call them composite objects. In order to really understand preservation of a Tonka form, no matter from what century your Tonka is, we have to understand the complicated composite object nature of it. For one thing, the Tonka form is, does not rest easy. It's warring within itself. This is what a Tonka looks like to you, and this is what's actually going on with it. The painting panel in the middle, or if it's printed, or even if it's textile, is held in tightly to the textile surround. And the two react differently to changes, for example, in temperature and relative humidity. And sometimes the tension in the stitching is very difficult for the iconographic panel in the middle. So this is what you see, but this is what is going on. So even if a tanka were in perfect conditions, it would begin to deteriorate because it has what conservators used to call inherent vice. Tankas are actually not just paintings. They're three-dimensional sculptures. The tanka form was developed because great teachers would travel all through the mountains to give teachings to people. Everything had to be rolled up on yaks, the tents, the texts, the robes, the tankas. So therefore, the tanka form was, had to be rolled up to go on the yak. And yet, this still happens. This is a gar, or a, well, originally you had the teachers traveling in gar form through the mountains, and now you have gars, which are meetings, Dharma meetings, and you see that the monks are still traveling with their tankas and rolling them up the same way. So when these monks, I was at this session, I said, well, where's your yak? You know, you could travel them flat and then there'd be a lot less damage. In our workshops in monasteries, we do work with monks and nuns about safer rolling, if rolling is what they have to do. Because rolling and roll storage, in fact, is the primary cause of damage to tankas. Here's a key, key question. The tanka form. Is it a tanka if it's only just the painting without its textile mounting? And this is a painting by a tanka master. When you go to mu most museums, this is what you see as a tanka. So, so many people think that this is what a tanka, I'd call it museum miseducation. There isn't really a label that this is just painting that was once in a tanka. Key question, is it a tanka if it's only the textile mounting without a painting or any panel in the middle? Most people would say no, but I've been wanting to do an exhibit of tanka textile mountings. The fact is that in the 70s, dealers and collectors were just taking the mountings off and throwing them away. So I collected them and they're in my study collection. They were given to me 
And I find them so important because they hold the history of textile um, technology for centuries. The master tailor was as high ranking in society as the master painter. These days, unfortunately, Tonka paintings are sewn in by machine. The tension's all wrong. In many paintings at the bottom, you'll see a traditional gift of silk to show that silk was highly prized. Shrine rooms, lachans, compas are totally splendid with all sorts of textiles as well as the tankas. Often uh, parts of replaced tanka mountings that um, a patron wanted to replace the tanka mountings if they're weak or he wanted to offer a gift, they were made into parts of dance costumes. When you look at tanka paintings themselves, you see the history of brocade um, design, which is quite fascinating. Often the master painter himself would do the brocade designs. I know someone asked me how this is done. It's done this way. These days, the artists are using ballpoint pen nibs to do the incision on the gold. Since 1970, I've been interviewing painters, Buddhist teachers, uh, textile artists, uh, meditators, all about tankas. Again, textile science is so important for a conservator and for you as a collector, because you have to know what you're working with in order to preserve it. I have uh, conservation scientists who are very generous in sharing their toys, and we do a lot of research on Tonka textiles and paintings. I'll be glad to share this with you later if you ask. What's really interesting is early uh, metal thread technology. We're doing research on that around the world. It's often on paper. We also do research on contemporary Tonkas to show there's actually no gold or silver in this. Tankas are a combination of older and newer. Here you see the different lines of stitches to show that this painting had several series of mountings. Let's go through the anatomy of a tanka. Start with the cover. The traditional covers, and if you're fortunate, your tankas have them, are no longer made. They were hand woven on a certain gauze weave loom, and they're quite interesting. They had a radish stamp and um, vegetable stamp design. And the quality of the silk is that it has a tooth. In other words, it clings to your fingers, it clings to the painting. Therefore, when we store them for preservation, we like to put an interleaving layer between the cover and the painting. You can see that the cover is actually clinging to the painting. And when I see this, I can hear the paint particles. I can hear them. They're going pop, 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 pop. A lot of covers were ripped off uh, or they deteriorated and not replaced. So your tanka may not have one. Raising the cover is always of interest. This is a high-ranking uh, Kempo, and he's showing us how to raise the cover. Um, it's very formal raising of cover. If you were to do this to an older cover, it would tear in half. In our workshops, we all practice raising covers. Let's go to the door or gate. Again, the tanka, its mounting itself, has its own iconography, which is different than but complementary to the painting. The door or gate located here welcomes you into the world of the tanka. The best quality patch of fabric was used. It's rare that you have the whole mounting with this quality fabric. You could see the door or gate, sometimes at the bottom, sometimes both the bottom and the top, to welcome you in to the world of the tanka. Here's a contemporary door or gate. The next feature of the tanka form is the rainbows. The rainbows extend the radiance 
of the iconography of the main figure of the deity and the, the subsidiary figures. This is extending his radiance, or her radiance. These are the rainbows. Usually it's red and then yellow. This is contemporary, and this is quite old, but it's uh, provincial. Sometimes the rainbows fade, but they're usually red, yellow. Some styles of mountings, because Tonka mountings are both regional and by choice of, of um, the collector or the artist or the monastery, sometimes they have one rainbow. And this style of mounting has no rainbows. This teacher, Kamtru Rinpoche VIII, the great painter, he chose to have his own painting framed in a Tonka mounting with no rainbows. Let's look at the lining on the back. Often they were chintz. And I know people do research about chintz. The lining on the back is something you don't see. It uh, looks baggy because it was made to be slightly baggy. So when it rolls, um, it does not cause it to con the tonka to constrict. They're made of silk, of cotton, and again, chintz. Often the tonka lining has a window to show you the blessing on the back, but often it does not. This does not mean that the tonka is not blessed because you can't see the blessing. Also, some tonkas are blessed without any visible signs of blessing. Let's go through the anatomy of a tonka. Other components, you have metal corners, you have wooden dowels with uh, decorative finials, you have cords to hang it up. And the most irritating to Westerners are the hanging ribbons because they hang in front of the painting. And of course, um, in Western museum aesthetics, the painting is the most important. So to have these textile elements hanging in front, not good. Um, here, you can see different types of the tabs hang down, the ribbons. Other components, again, are wood and metal. We're talking about the sculptural form of a tanka. It's not just a painting. It's three-dimensional. And for its preservation, you have to consider all of these elements, metal, wood, silk, leather. The wooden dowel on top often pokes out because it, um, the sharp edges um, tear the edges of the sleeve. On the bottom, the wooden dowel is often removed for um, framing or if the tanka is transported um, to, let's say, an art dealer. We have old decorative knobs. We have new ones, and this wood uh, is put in this wooden dowel to replace one that was removed. Um, the decorative knob can be aged in appearance. This has been sealed. And our next anatomy of a tanka element is this hoarding, which had been cut when the original dowel was removed. The cording is meant to hold up the tanka cover, but also, as we saw with the rainbows, it runs inside the inner rainbow around the inner edge right by the iconographic panel. There's the cording. Also, you have um, ribbons or leather to hold up the tanka because it was hanging. Here's leather corner to protect the top dowel from poking out and uh, original cording. Cording is hard to find your place. Originally, it was made the same way by hand that it was created for use in um, pujas and uh, traditionally by nuns. So in one of my workshops, the nuns were creating cording for tankas for us, for preservation. It's important that if you have leather holding up the tanka, that you realize it could break at any time. It's important to reinforce it. And then there are labels. Let's talk about tankas that are all textile. They actually don't have a painting in the middle. This is from the Royal Palace Monastery Temple in Sikkim. And these tankas are all textile. It's one of my plans to go there and help do the preservation work on them. This is from the private collection of the Dalai Lama. 
This is all textile. It's done in a different um, technique where that fine silk is pasted down to paper. And the reason that's done is often the support, which is uh, also silk textile, usually silk, often cannot bear the weight of the applique decorative elements, which include um, pieces of brocade and uh, often a lot of gems. Large textile tankas are especially a challenge for those who are their caretakers. I interviewed the uh, master tailor who made this to find his technique, again, because to preserve, uh, you have to understand exactly what you're working with, the methods and materials, especially so for the sculptural tanka form. This is being raked by light all day. It's huge, it's in a temple. And it's, it was made with white glue, partially. I had asked um, in my interview if any glue was used, and the white glue is beginning to uh, deteriorate because it was just commercial white glue. Large textile tankas uh, aren't handled that gently. They're part of the life of the monastery. They're usually shown once a year. And um, yes, they're meant to be quite sturdy. Here, it's, this is the lining. It's being held up for people to walk through it. This is quite beautiful. Um, it rained the day, the one day a year that it was shown. This is the pulley system if you want to know how they're displayed. Often on mountains or at, on platforms meant for their display just one day a year. And then they are rolled up like this tightly and carried in a huge leather sleeve and then stored in a monastery storeroom uh, like a large worm in a huge leather sleeve. Unfortunately, if it rained that day, they are rolled up and stored wet within the leather sleeve till the next year. Let's look at paintings. I know everyone loves the tanka paintings. The painting is just part of the tanka form. Is it a tanka if it's only the painting without its textile mounting? Most people would say yes. Tanka painters traditionally were apprentices for their whole childhood. Um, just like um, Western master paintings are made by um, workshops where there's a master and apprentices, it's the same for tanka paintings traditionally. Today, they often paint on walls as well as tankas. Here are some very accomplished tanka painters who are using Asian paints for the outside of the stupa. And it's really interesting because these paints were a good choice because they have very close to the mineral colors with mineral pigments in them. And they do withstand the elements during the monsoon, etc. This monk is showing us that this wall painting was actually made by tanka painters in their studio and then glued on the wall after. This is quite common. Tanka painters might paint the entire interior of the monastery shrine room as well as a tanka within it. Let's go through the anatomy of a tanka painting. The support, for those of you that know what that means, it is the cloth that it's painted on. You can tell an older tanka support because it was made by hand on a small loom and therefore you have this seam in the middle. You can't see the seam from the front. It's well disguised with the ground and polished. But if you want to know if your tanka is, well, of a certain age, look for the seam. Also, when I'm doing condition reports on tankas, I definitely look at the reverse first. I look at the back of the support to see what condition it's in. This tanka looks all right from the front, but with a lighting techniques we use, you can see the condition of it. This is raking light from the side and transmitted light. Actually, the tanka support is in extremely fragile condition. Transmitted light shows the very fragile condition of many tanka supports, usually from rolling, unrolling, and roll storage. 
Usually tanka supports are cotton. Rarely you find a silk one like this. The most amazing silk tanka I saw is horizontal, it's 10 feet long, and it's only this wide because that was the width of an original loom for silk. This is in the Sven Hedin collection of tankas in Sweden. It's an amazing silk tanka, very, very rare. It's actually because of the rolling and unrolling and the weakness in tanka supports, it was rare that a tanka would be patched traditionally. A painter would be called in when it became unworkable to paint a new tanka with the iconography, copying is within the tradition. You often get tears in the supports along the seams. Again, on the support, ground was applied. Traditionally, yakai glue. You can have uh, the ground in black. This was the choice of this great master painter. This is a visionary painting, which was not copied. In other words, the most rare type of painting, for your information, comes from a great meditation master who's also a tanka painter, and it comes from his vision. And it's his choice to use a black ground. There are red ground paintings, but you have to be sure that uh, sometimes the ground is neutral color, but um, they apply uh, black or red above it. It's one or the other. Good to know for your preservation. The apprentices would have done this. He's applying, mixed the ground with high glue. He's applying it. He polished it. This takes two weeks to do. Apply more, polish it, put it in the sun. And only after that, only after the support and the ground are ready, usually traditionally prepared by apprentices, do you have the design and painting. Usually by iconographic, icon, iconometric graphs, like this sometimes stamped. Then flat colors and shading. People want to know questions about the colors. For a tanka painter, like this great master tanka painter I interviewed, his colors were his most precious possession. He had a family and children, but he loved, he treasured his colors. Let's talk about traditional colors. Traditional colors were earth pigments. And the color gradation was achieved by the gradation of the ground. So this is the way a tanka may look to you. But a traditional tanka actually looks like this. In other words, I'd like to think of it, if you were in an airplane flying over the landscape, you'd have mountains, you'd have the texture of farmers' fields, you'd have lakes, and you'd have um, well, you'd have buildings. So this is a three-dimensional quality of a traditional tanka painting. It's because of the ground pigments and how they're applied in layers. And this is why it's so fragile. We do a lot of research on tanka colors. When you're looking at an older tanka, I want you to think about these um, minerals. This is what you're working with. We've done a lot of research on traditional tankas, and this is how we date tankas. Question, first participant question. How do older tanka differs from freshly painted? Well, of course, time moves on, and you have traditional and contemporary. Even the, even the contemporary tanka master is asking, how long will his tankas last? In actual fact, I'm really sorry to say this, but traditional tangas have lasted so long because you had the apprentices who spent so much time preparing the yak high glue that was mixed with the traditional pigments. In actual fact, I did an interview of, uh, he's now dead, of an aristocrat from Bhutan who was sent to be a tanka painter. He was vegetarian and he spent four years making high glue, distilling the yak glue. And he said it made him ill, the smell of it. But only because of that uh, was the, um, the ground and paint layers so resistant to the rolling and unrolling. So these days, if painters are using poster colors or they're mixing the colors they use, part poster, part um, commercial high glue, part pigment, part tube glue. If they mix it all together, then uh, the longevity of their beautiful tanka paintings 
may not be as long as traditional. Some styles you find in, in modern paintings are a grade palette, originally done to look older, now it's a style, and a pastel palette. These are only done with contemporary paints. You would not have found this traditional tankas. Here's a key question. If you have a newer tanka, and it's not even painted, it's all synthetic, <laughs> is it less spiritually significant than a traditional one? I think the answer to that differs from teacher to teacher. Actually, most people say it is, it depends on the blessing, and if it offers the seed of merit to those who see it, it's perfectly spiritually significant. Fakes and forgeries, questions on this. This monk is really concerned about fake tankas because he feels that um, people are being robbed by being sold fakes and also that blessed tankas are not being protect, protected and preserved. Let's look at tourist trade tankas. The iconography is just not right and um, the painting style is not right and also your support, well this is painted on something like a bed sheet. It, had, it was very large, it had no seams. Sometimes the iconography is just not accurate. There's a whole school of um, young boys in Nepal who paint these fakes and there's no true iconography. The mountings are not traditional. And sometimes you see custom seals. Does this mean that it's old and it's approved to be leave the country? It's not old enough to have a problem being left leave the country or is it just applied just to make it saleable? How to spot a fake? Look at the reverse. Again, when I examine tankas, I look at the reverse. I begin. Look at the reverse. This is just a large piece of fabric with brown dirt rubbed on it. This is damage in unlikely places, not from rolling and unrolling, and dirt applied. This fake, um, it, uh, the mon the, they said that it was from a monastery that they the monks had to eat. Please purchase this. It was painted at yesterday, actually, by some fakers, and they even tried to make the go look older. You could see the style is not exactly accurate, and this on, on your right, this is uh, a contemporary but accurate style. I have a whole scientific analysis series on fakes. This is uh, no iconography, but sold for a lot of money. And this is in 14th century in a museum. And as the monk was concerned about older tankas, but also about fakes and forgeries, I wanted to see if it was, well, completely overpainted. So I used some post capture software in my phone to uh, try to analyze what was original and what was not, or if it was all a fake. On the left, Someone paid $2,000 for this. It has no iconography. On the right, it's an honest contemporary mandala. I'll tell you the story another time, but it's quite interesting. The most insulting thing is a fake impairment. This is a key question. If you had, you were in charge of preserving a fake, would you approach it differently if you found out it was a fake than if you knew that it was a blessed empowered object. The tanka form is evolving. Time moves on. Here's a tanka form for Celtic iconography. And you have fantastic tanka painters painting, um, chronically chronicling the life of recent masters. Change is constant. Now you have traditional mountings with printed centers, you have scroll forms for tankas, and you have a lot of digital tankas, which are fascinating. Copying is within the tradition. So as time moves on, an older tanka, when it became too weak to be used, it would be respectfully retired, and a newer one would be made. So what are you copying, the iconography or the whole tanka style? digital tankas. Let's talk about preservation of tankas in monasteries. I am watching the time. Monasteries are very traditional and somewhat secretive in that 
uh, what goes on in a monastery stays in a monastery. So when I work in monasteries, I don't leave with any documentation of their tankas. I teach them how to do the documentation. I completely respect confidentiality. Some things in monasteries are done as they were done, centuries for centuries. But then again, things have changed. For example, the caretakers perhaps were caretakers for their life as monks in a monastery. And the next caretaker would get full transmission about how to do it. These days on the rota system, caretakers change fast and there's not always transmission of where things are and what they are. This is one question that I got before. Please show us mon uh, monastery context tankas. We do treasure caretaker training uh, workshops, preservation in monasteries. We teach risk assessment, disaster planning and mitigation, safer storage display and handling, digital documentation and video interview of elders. What we teach in the monasteries for tanka preservation is what you need to know for preservation of the tankas in your home and offices. Let's talk about sacred art. The question of working with sacred art is very complicated for conservators because on a personal and professional level, you have to decide what defines something as sacred and what it is in the objects you're working with that you are preserving. If you're preserving the blessings, for example, then you may not feel free, be free in fact, to give it cleaning because you'd be cleaning away the blessings. I feel strongly about that. And if a tank is in a museum for a long time, does it lose its sacred quality? In monasteries, risk assessment and disaster planning is the way to go for preservation of tankas. Here are some monks learning about that. What we do is we take, in treasure caretaker training, the scientific approach to risk assessment and disaster planning, and we make it in a perfectly practical and low cost in the monastery setting. Every monk and nun has examples of fire, water, criminals, human mistakes, earthquakes. It's very practical. And for preservation of tangas in your home and office, the same. We added pandemic recently. We wrote an article about uh, dealing with um, pandemics in preserving your monastery treasures. Here's a question from a viewer, hello. Our family tanka is kept in subtropic location without air conditioning. How can it keep it from mold and humidity? All right, let's review the risks and hazards. Which risk and hazard is this? Again, does this plastic protect or damage the tanka? Let's review, list, review list, risks and hazards. The risk and hazard for this question is temperature and relative humidity. The mold cycle, indeed. I would like to do another webinar, just the risks and hazards for tankas. Henry, who's watching, went to a very important cave of Guru Rinpoche and was concerned about this tanka because water was pouring down the cave wall from the outside. He was very concerned about it. What risk and hazard is that? It's about water damage. And indeed, that is something we can talk about for the preservation of your tankas. These works, risks and hazards workshops go very well in monasteries because they're practical and low cost. Storage is so important for tankas in monasteries and also for your home and office. However, in monasteries, there's a whole component of the sacred. Something is not less sacred when it's in storage than it is when it's on display. Storage techniques cause a lot of physical damage. Sometimes tankas are respectfully when they're with reorg, which you had. Um, previous webinar, I did a reorg session on tanka storage rooms. And it's my goal to go to tanka storage rooms with the reorg method and uh, make practical and low costs upgrades to protect the tankas. We can use locally found materials. Here this market cloth has been boiled and hung out to dry in the sun and used for storing 
uh, textiles because after all, acid-free paper does not work in monsoon weather. And this is a, a shop in Nepal just on the street. It has a lot of good materials for storage. These masks are hung, hung on the wall. Perhaps we could upgrade with a cardboard box. This is a Dharma center that's hung its tankas. However, they're right by a door. So anyone walking through bumps right against them. Documentation is so important for your tankas, both in monasteries and your home and offices. We do a lot of documentation, both written and on mobiles. She wants to know how documentation protects tankas from future disasters. Well, the fact is, that uh, so many monks and nuns have, well, come to harm. When there's a disaster, they run around the monastery looking for the precious tankas to save them at their own peril. And that's why um, documentation of what tankas you have, where they're located. What tankas you have, where they're located, and how they've been treated is so important. Um, and also, if you have disaster or if a tanka is damaged by rolling and unrolling, the future generation should have pictures of it and the history of it. It's all in the documentation. The problem is that if we worked um, with some caretakers and then I go back, and this is one monastery, I have been to that monastery all these years and continue going. Every year I work with new caretakers. We go over the same things. That's why documentation is so important. Documentation is in all languages. I can easily provide whatever you need for your own documentation in monasteries or home offices in your language. Documentation is by video and by your digital camera. All of the monks in our workshops practice giving lectures on the documentation. We also insist that the elders are documented by video. This uh, nun and others talk about the history of the tankas in their nunnery. And your grandma could talk about the history of your most precious belongings, your home and office. And unless you video her talking about that, that history might be lost to your grandchildren. Tankas and monastery. Traditional usage combined with traditional techniques. Tankas in museums. Well, there's excellence in display, handling, and storage, but it's non-traditional aesthetics. When I first worked in um, museums in India, for example, there was a, a continuity between monastery and museum, and some people would come to do pilgrimage in the museum and have smoke offerings and everything to the tankas. And uh, well, now, um, where museums used to be sterile, actually, it's going the other way. This is a beautiful shrine room in the Rubin Museum in New York, where uh, museums are offering information about how tankas and other sacred art would look in a traditional context. So it's come full circle. This is quite admirable. Tankas in museums are often displayed um, in a sterile uh, presentation. However, we can learn a lot in that uh, from museum tricks, we have um, the plexi case to keep, um, well, the visitors away from touching and to also to keep the uh, climate, temperature and relative humidity, which is monitored to keep it stable. If you have leather hanging cords that which might break, they're reinforced, little clips to hold up the weight of the tanka so it doesn't tear. Sharon, who's watching, wants to know about framing. Yes, we learn a lot from museums about proper framing. Although sometimes in museums, you might think that this is the entire tank of form. A good way to do it, and this is um, an early museum framing I did in the 1970s for the full tank of form. It's set back in a shadow box. We can learn a lot about handling from museums. Um, they're very, very careful. And the museum people, the conservators, the curators, they're excellent in handling. This tanka could not be stored flat, but the curator is a conservator or rolling it around something, so it's not crushing itself. We learn about shipping flat, and we learn about storage. This would not work for 
for monasteries with the monsoon and pests. But this is excellent storage in the Rubin Museum of Art. It's a work table and this tunk is a stored flat. Thank you, Rubin Museum, for use of these pictures. Again, you could see this would be the ideal storage. And the tankas are interleaved between each other and also between the cover and the painting. Of course, in monasteries in the monsoon, we'd use a cloth and lot paper. Thank you, Rubin Museum. Again, and they've all been inventoried. American Museum of Natural History has fabulous tanka storage. This would be ideal for all monasteries if they could only afford it. Donors, please consider it. Uh, they're sealed up against pests um, and they have these drawers for the tankas where they're laid flat and they're perfectly safe. You can get low cost copies of this. This is just um, a repurposed uh, natural history case and you can make them yourself from acid-free materials. You can make storage that is earthquake proof at low cost, very low cost. For your home and office, here's a question. Works hanging in our home and office, in our home. And how do you protect family tankas in a home with children, as baby Theo? The preservation of tankas in your home and workplace, well, it's a combination of respect and actual usage in monasteries and the techniques of preservation from museums. So it's a combination of that. For your home and office, for your tankas, please do a risk assessment and disaster planning. You have to know the risks of your tankas and what we'll do if there's a fire and what you'll do if the roof leaks for your, to save your tankas. Document your tankas for future generation, even for insurance purposes. And also uh, interview the elders about the history of them. Safer storage handling and display in your home and office context. Here's a quick summary, we're almost out of time. In your home and office, rolling and unrolling your tanka is the most harmful thing you can do. Rolling compresses the delicate paint layers and the layers of chalk and hide glue they rest on. The paint layers will crack and fall off and the textile will tear. Tankas can be transported and stored lying flat. It's best to hang up your tanka and not roll it after that. Don't pull on your tanka to try to adjust the shape if it's not flat because tankas are three-dimensional sculptures. These are all for the home and office owners. Be careful raising the cover because your finger may touch the painting as you go up and also the covers are delicate. Hang your tanka out of direct sunlight, not overheating your air conditioning element. Even a bright spotlight on it can direct heat towards it and cause irreparable heat and light damage. Resist the temptation to clean your tankas. Tankas are not dirty and do not need to be cleaned. Here, baby Theo will soon be splattering baby food on his tanka. Here in the office, the light is damaging it and the paper files are scratching against it. And here um, in a hallway, the people walk by and scratch the tanka. Risk assessment, please. Treatment options. Question, we're near the end of our time. I wish we had another hour. Conservation treatments. For both the painting and the textile. This is my main message to you, besides not rolling the tankas. Please prevent damage from occurring. If a tanka is damaged, stabilize its condition. Never try to make an older tanka look as if it were painted yesterday. Respect the evidence of traditional usage of a sacred art form. Tankas are not dirty and cannot be cleaned. Repainting a tanka because you want it to look clean and new is never successful, and you create permanent damage as you do if you try to clean it. If you want a new looking tanka, hire a tanka painter to paint a new tanka and preserve the original tankas with safe storage, 
handling and display. Cleaning does not work. Textile mounting replacement, a lot of questions and advice. Parts of the textile mounting as you're working on them, the cording is difficult. Preservation does not mean to change an old tanka into a new tanka. Tankas are a combination of older and newer. We have a lot of traditional mending and preservation. There's the gluers and the menders. It has to do with the tanka you're working on. Maybe just stabilize. Mixing old paintings and new mountings. Again, the tanka form is at war with itself. At the best of times, the painting, the iconographic panel, wars with its textile mounting. So if you put an old painting in a new mounting, it's going to cause destruction. Or a new painting in an old mounting. It's difficult. They're not comfortable with each other. Here's some simple mending by nuns. Because their tankas were needed in their nunneries for everyday use. These tankas were probably worth a fortune on the market. They were the workhorses in the monastery. They were used for traditional purposes and they had to be in working order. And the nuns did a fabulous job. In museums, we do that too. Again, if you're working with uh, preserving your tanka, the covers are very difficult. This cover took a year for preservation. I don't think many owners could do that these days. Here are some options. We're almost out of time for your painting support. Well, all of these options are very technical. And with conservators, we can have another webinar about this. But you have to be very cognizant of the fact that you don't want to change the nature of the original tanka. In other words, by um, infusing it with a paste or infusing it with a synthetic waters, an um, enemy of a tanka. Here is a restorer who sprayed the whole tanka with water and used food paste to line it. This is difficult for a lot of, a lot of reasons. For one thing, the three-dimensional uh, quality of the tanka was lost as the ground and paint layers sunk into the support. Mylar was used in the back so you could see the blessings that had problems. Sometimes it's best just to use patches. Okay, new tanka supports. Well, Fred, it will last as long as how you treat it. 300 years is if you put it in a drawer in the dark in perfect conditions. 50 years is if baby Theo splatters his baby food on it or if your cat scratches it or if you have it in bright light. Consolidation, again, technical for conservators. Let's have another webinar and discuss this. You don't want glistening synthetic. Cleaning and in painting. Please just stabilize. Don't overclean with water. Technical tanka in painting. Not even a meditation master knows all the iconography for all the lineages. It is very questionable if you fill in hands, their mudras faces, what the hands are holding, iconography, very questionable. I believe in stabilizing the tanka and then doing digital restoration. In other words, you keep the original stable and then you can um, have a high quality uh, digital print and work with that. Please stabilize the condition of the original and then reproduce the original. In conclusion, I really want to say that by understanding that the tanka form is so diverse and challenging, in fact, a tanka is many forms and is still evolving. We can use risk assessment, disaster planning, documentation, safer storage, display and handling to preserve our tankas, monastery, museum, home and office. We want the tankas to continue to serve their function in our monastery, museum, home and office, and we want to offer them respect. I am at your service in the future. Please send me your questions. 
and I hope to have more webinars like this. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Al Sheftal. Thank you very much uh, for this really uh, illustrative uh, presentation, and which really uh, discussed about all the uh, processes of making of tanka, the treatments that are used, and all. So I think the audience would have gained a lot uh, from this webinar today. At least I have learned a lot, uh, and thank you for really showing us the beautiful tankas from all over the world. So uh, now I will uh, take some questions. So when you were speaking, I have received a lot of questions. So I will put forward these questions to you. Uh, there is one question from uh, from an audience who says. Do you, do you have tankas in Darjeeling? This is the question. Are there tankas in Darjeeling? Is that yes. the question? Yes, yes. Yes, there are many tankas in Darjeeling. In Darjeeling, there are monasteries full of tankas and also private individuals who have tankas in their homes. Darjeeling is rich with tankas. Traditional, new, there's painters in Darjeeling. Yes, indeed. The answer to your question is certainly there are beautiful tankas in Darjeeling. Yes, I've been to monasteries there and to private homes with tankas. And uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Thank you for asking. And the question is, what is the basic difference between a tanka and a Japanese scroll? Japanese and Chinese scrolls, um, um, either paper or thin silk on paper, were meant to be remounted once a generation. So therefore, they were designed uh, to withstand, in fact, to benefit from um, the use of uh, paste, traditional paste techniques, and uh, water application, water soaking. And uh, therefore, um, it's perfectly acceptable to do um, remounting with a lot of water and the use of water paste on Japanese and Chinese scroll paintings and Korean. That's the way they were designed. That's the way they were made. However, just because tankas are rolled up or look like they're in scroll form does not mean that the methods and materials are at all uh, safe with the application of that much water in the techniques of preservation of Japanese, Chinese, and Korean scroll paintings. It's a totally different methods and materials that made them and totally different methods and materials to stabilize the condition and to preserve them. They are very different, totally different. That is a really good question, thank you. And we do have and sincere problems when people are applying um, methods of preservation, conservation, restoration that were um, meant for Chinese and Japanese scroll paintings, again, meant to be um, remounted once a generation with a huge amount of water and watery paste, when that is applied to tanka paintings, which are, um, well, do not get along well with water because of the original hide glue that holds together the ground and the paint layers. So this is a fundamentally important question that you ask, and I want to thank you for asking it. And then one uh, person wants to know which stream of Buddhism uh, has tanka paintings? Wow, all lineages of Buddhism have tanka paintings. And as a matter of fact, even um, pre-Buddhist Bun religion has a lot of uh, fantastic tanka paintings, just with different iconography. A tanka painting is a form, a form that, a form of teaching that was used when a lot of people did not read. They didn't read the texts. So uh, both Buddhist and Bun iconography and um, information about visualization for your meditation practice was transmitted through tanka paintings, through all lineages and all kinds of texts. And therefore, the paintings are very specific to certain texts, to certain teachings. Um, your teacher might say that he'd like you to meditate on this deity and the information for that could come from a long text 
or from your shorter version text, or it could come from the Tanka that you are directed to use for your visualization. So Tanka paintings, again, are for all lineages of Buddhism. They're used for illustration, for meditation, guidance, for understanding of texts and teachings. Again, for all lineages of Buddhism and also for pre-Buddhist Bun religion. Thank you for asking that question. And I do work in preservation for all lineages. I think uh, maybe they want to know about uh, Hinayan Buddhism or Mahayan Buddhism, where uh, it is more prevalent. I think it is more prevalent in Hinayan uh, Buddhism, in, uh, which is prevalent in, in, the, uh, in the Himalayan regions of, of India, Bhutan. Oh. I see what you're saying, but actually tankas were really important through the whole width of the Silk Road. I work on collections of Silk Road tankas and I lecture on Silk Road tankas. And the tankas are not just up in the mountains. If you look at a map of the Silk Road, there are tankas from the east to the west. All along the Silk Road, you find tankas that have traveled on the Silk Road and that have originated from different areas in the Silk Road. So Tankas are not just from the Himalayan region. They're from the entire width and length and history of the Silk Road. And that's why there's so many different styles and techniques of Tankas. In terms of the Yanas, Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana, you can find Tankas that illustrate all of them. It's not just Vajrayana. And so therefore, because there's so many different texts in Buddhism and approaches and teachings, therefore your tanka iconographic panel, whether it's painted or whether it's textile, will also illustrate any or all of the three yanas. Well, if we're saying goodbye, I welcome you all to contact me in the future. And thank you so much for this opportunity.